this meeting is now being recorded. Um, quick precursor to the folks watching on recording, apologies that we skipped the first couple minutes of the uh, conversation today, but all of this will be linked um, in the notes so you can take a look at the first few slides. Okay, so what is bias? And this is, this is not my definition. Someone much smarter than me wrote this definition, so I'm just gonna read it out for you. Bias is a disproportionate weight in favor of or against an idea or thing, usually in a way that is closed-minded, prejudicial, or unfair. Since they are often built on incomplete information, we need to be aware of them and challenge them when they are inaccurate because some biases unfairly impact people intentionally or unintentionally. That is one of the most important phrases when we're thinking about bias, whether intentional or unintentional, it has the same impact. It can be unfair. And just think about when you use the word, oh, but I'm biased. You know, you're already kind of saying, oh, I know something about this isn't quite right, but I'm biased. So that, that's why I'm making this decision. This is kind of what that's getting to. There are different types of bias. We have explicit bias, implicit bias, which is what we really want to dig at today, and then structural bias, which we kind of just took a look at in that first cycle of socialization. So explicit bias, we are affirmatively aware that we hold a particular prejudice or preference or opinion about something or someone. For example, a lot of us might have explicit biases here in Pueblo about which farm grows the best Pueblo chili. You might have an explicit bias. Um, an implicit bias is the process of associating stereotypes or attitudes towards categories of people without conscious awareness, often contradicting or consciously held beliefs, often contradicting our consciously held beliefs. That's important. I'm sorry, I, I blipped on that. Our consciously held beliefs. So we may say one thing, but actually our actions and our implicit unconscious unexamined bias are leading us to do another. Um, uh, an example here might be, uh, teenagers just sleep all day. They just all sleep all day. That is an implicit unconscious unexamined bias because actually teenagers have really busy schedules and are quite, quite, quite crammed when it comes to getting things done. So that old sort of idea that, oh, teenagers, forget it. That's an implicit bias. And then you have structural bias, the systems explicit and implicit that inform the formal and unspoken norms of an organization or society that define value, meritocracy, excellence, et cetera. So some forms of structural bias might be the way education works. If you are not a good visual learner, you might have a challenging time with online learning. If you're someone who does better with your hands, you might have a challenge with online learning and yet you're being required to online learn as your only form of education. That's a structural bias that might cause um, undue or unintended harm. So here are a couple of images um, and I clicked through that a little too quickly. Safest Williams is a gentleman from the UK who started a social media project called 56 Black Men where he took pictures of um, his peers in a hoodie, beautiful portraits in a hoodie, and then allowed people to react to those portraits. When folks actually found out what it is that the men in the portraits did for a living or had contributed to society, they really had to examine um, some of the initial reactions they had to this particular study. So there is a model out there um, that sort of describes our decision-making process and the reason we have biases into two key systems. One is thinking fast and one is thinking slow. I 
bet everyone knew that two plus two was four. And I bet everyone thought of peanut butter and jelly when I put up these images of peanut butter and jelly. That's thinking fast. This one might take you a little bit more time. Okay. We're meant to rely on our um, skill and our patience and logic to help us get through this decision. So implicit bias is the process of associating stereotypes or attitudes towards categories of people without conscious awareness, often contradicting our own consciously held beliefs. It's something that we don't even realize is going on. So when we take a look at these images, you know, what is coming to your mind? Are you hanging on to an implicit bias? And as we've come to find, these implicit biases lead to structural biases because they create a cycle where we ascribe to these stereotypes, we allow them to perpetuate, and this leads us to structural bias where they become entrenched in our society. What encourages our reliance on implicit bias? What might encourage some of these things? Throw them in the chat if you have one that comes to mind. I'll pop through them one by one, but it's no surprise. Stress allows you to rely on implicit bias. When you're distracted, you rely on implicit bias. When you're hungry, you rely on implicit bias. When you're tired, you're particularly vulnerable to rely on implicit bias. Why is that? Well, if you remember at the start of the presentation, we said that the brain can actually only focus on four or five things at once. So if one of these things is happening to you, already you're more vulnerable to um, put yourself in a situation where you might default to your implicit biases. How does this manifest? I'm gonna show a couple of examples here. So this is a, a story that came out two weeks ago and essentially um, a woman, an African-American woman in Indianapolis was having her home appraised and she had her home appraised twice and she couldn't understand why her home was being appraised at a value so much lower than the average for the neighborhood. And then she had her neighbor her white neighbor stand in at her house during the appraisal and the value doubled. That's one example. Um, let's hear it from the mouths of babes. And I'm going to hope that um, the sound comes through clear to you. We're gonna watch this video. I'm from Haiti and Nigeria. Um, like three things, like I'm Dominican. Uh, Puerto Rican and Black. I'm biracial. I have an African American father and an Irish American mom. My name's Mami. Um I'm Muslim. I'm Indian, British, Scottish, and American. My parents are from Venezuela, and I was sharing like one of the foods that we eat, and then I got made fun of. They were like, "What is that? Ew." Oh, hell, what is that? And it, like, I cried because <laughs> I felt like, oh, there's something wrong where I'm from. Like, maybe, like, it's bad. Like, I'm different. I am an African American adopted girl, only child, um, and I live with my two dads. I remember when I was younger, I went to, with my family, to a restaurant and they made us pay in advance just in case we like didn't pay afterwards. And the heck was kind of upsetting. You start to notice that people are different and you have comments, might, they might be racist or they might not be. But by the time you get older, you know that it is racist and you should stop. I feel a little scared about if I, you know, just walk down the street, you know, cops might just think I'm, I'm doing something bad. And then if I'm trying to explain to them, they won't listen and then just start beating me up. 
and doing terrible things to me. I think there's like this anxiety that kind of comes with being biracial, like that kind of eats away at you. Like almost like you have to prove yourself like that you're one or the other. Like, for example, like I hear the phrase, you're not black all the time. People sometimes think that I'm supposed to like talk ghetto or like whatever that is. Oh, she's uneducated because she's African-American. Because I'm Hispanic or Latino, I can't have like a lot of money. Just this weekend, I went with my friend to Urban Outfitters and we were shopping and I really wanted to try on this dress. And then this lady that was just like there, she's kind of like watching me and just like, uh, I'm not gonna steal it or anything. I think white privilege is the idea that in your everyday life, life you're getting treated differently and sometimes with more respect or people just trust you more or they have certain expectations of you like you might be smarter or you might be wealthier um, because you're white it makes me feel guilty sometimes even though it's not my fault like I feel guilty for having a privilege that like I don't deserve. If I was ever like the mayor or something that controls a policeman I would want to go out and look in the neighborhoods where there are people that's very friendly so you can pick them instead of like these guys that's just doing all this training. It's better to pick people that's more minded with the community than to just pick some new guy and get on the street. Like it's just not gonna work out. We have like these kids, from, they're Ecuadorian and they get made fun of because they look Mexican and they get told on a daily basis, oh, you like tacos? Oh, you like churros? You saw, how come I saw your mom on the corner selling ices? Like it's like I feel bad for them personally because I'm like, wow, like they're not and like even though they tell them I'm not Mexican, I'm Ecuadorian, they still get teased. So as you can see from a very early age, um, we're dealing with implicit bias all the time. And it makes sense for us as leaders in this movement to consider how these things are at play and think about how we dismantle them. So for a person who might be biased, there are a couple of different types that you may not even know are going on in the background. The halo effect. Oh, I work for the city or, oh, I went to Yale or, oh, I, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, you might use that to think that you are, quote unquote, holier than thou. And then there's the confirmation bias where you say, oh, well, take a look at the stats you know, take a look at the numbers, who's making up all of the, you know, folks that are failing in school. That's like kind of using the numbers to work in your favor to confirm whatever bias you want to have rather than saying, hey, there might be something bigger there. This might be a structural issue, not a, a, a class or a race issue. And then we come to the class bias and you look at people and you judge them by the way they look you know, where they say they're from, where they say they live, what they drive. Um, it's, it's really funny when I roll up in my beater truck and most of you have seen it and, you know, folks come to know me a little bit more, they, they think a little bit differently about, whoa, why is that girl driving that truck? You know, so that's a class bias that I experience all the time, which is so silly. And communication style, are you someone that is formal and has very specific communication? Are you more indirect and free flowing? Do you have a challenge communicating orally? Are you more of a storyteller? Do you like to have an arc and a poetry? And how is that impacting the way that you view other people who may not have the same communication style as you? And then there's the folks on the receiving end of a bias who are being, um, you know, a stereotype is being put on them like we heard from those young people. 
or there's this fear of a stereotype that you might not live up to. And then of course, um, microaggressions, and we can do a whole session on microaggressions. And if you're not familiar with that term yet, I invite you to Google it and, and go a little bit more deeply. But there are um, our implicit biases lead us to sometimes do harm unintentionally through microaggressions. And that's pushing away other people's comments, interrupting people, making culturally insensitive comments, speaking over them. Um, these are all microaggressions that can have an impact on person who's receiving your bias. So these are just some things to consider. And remember, this happens when we are stressed, when we're distracted, when we're hungry and we're tired, more often than when you're not those things. So you want to be aware of this and you want to challenge your potential biases um, by doing a couple of things. Take care of yourself. Slow down in your decision making. Slow down. Justify your decisions through system two reasoning. Are you being logical? Are you evaluating all of the evidence at hand? Are you giving yourself enough time to make uh, that kind of decision? Develop and understand your own baselines. You know, again, this group tested out at minimization. Where are you in terms of your implicit bias um, kind of baselines is the right word, but have you ever sat to ask yourself, what are my implicit biases? Um, you can also take action towards understanding that. You can push yourself to be uncomfortable and you can help hold other people accountable when we see something happen that shouldn't. Question your first impressions and then ask others for feedback on your decisions. Those are all really important to kind of um, stepping away from implicit bias and being explicit and intentional about our decisions. Very simply, there are three things that you can do right now. Become aware of your own biases. Work to increase your empathy for other people's situation. You have never walked in anyone else's shoes but your own. Work to increase empathy. And then most importantly, practice mindfulness and loving kindness. This work is such a gift. It is such a gift that we get to come together and do this work and that we get to come together as a community and make improvements on our food system, something that touches every single one of us. We can do that with deep mindfulness and loving kindness every time. Um, and if you really want to dig in, you can check out implicit.harvard.edu, and there's a bunch of tests that you can take to sort of check your own personal baseline. So we're going to break into small groups just for a couple of minutes um, and ask these questions. We're a little behind schedule. If you want to throw notes, excuse me, notes in mural, you can. If not, like I said, no big deal. We're just going to give about five, six minutes to this um, conversation. So the questions are, what do you know about implicit bias now that you didn't know before? Did anything surprise you? How might implicit bias impact our food systems work? And what other information or tools would you like to explore? So I'm going to set up the groups and I'm going to stop sharing, put these questions in the chat for everyone. So they're there for you. And then we will, um, yeah, break out. So give me just a second to get these in the chat. That way you all have them. Okay, so this is going to everyone. So those are the three questions and here you go into your breakout rooms. Um, we're only gonna be here for a little bit. All right, please go to thy room. <laughs>
Thanks, all right. <laughs> the Colorado Health Foundation has an opportunity for you to be an advocate via storytelling and the Colorado Blueprint to End Hunger as well. So we are going to learn from our peers. We're going to learn from our storytelling pioneers in the group. Um, Dr. Kelly, Brandy, and Derek all participated in a workshop by the Colorado, excuse me, by the Pueblo Department of Public Health and Environment to capture their stories. And I'll let them provide um, comments on them, but let's watch them first. Um, so you can have your emotional reactions first, and then we'll hear from the storyteller's perspective um, what was what was happening. So give me a moment to share my screen. Once again, we're going to start with Dr. Kelly. What the fuck? Derek, you're not on mute. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. My bad. I, was... I never learned to pronounce my own last name. Kelly Elizabeth Marin. No erre or accent included. It was a mystery to me as I never met my Spanish great grandparents. Since my grandmother was white, they wanted nothing to do with us. I only heard stories of my dad growing up on their pig and avocado farms. Now the Carlsbad shopping mall sits on Marron Road. When I was 10, my parents separated, and I took my mother's maiden name, Brooke. I have vague memories of my family growing our own food in a greenhouse in Oregon. Those were some of my happiest times, but they didn't last. We had been renting for three years and never cared for the yard as if it were our own. But when COVID-19 hit, my husband and I didn't know what to do. It made us realize we can't eat money. We amended the soil and threw in some seeds. I dreamed of summer squash, tomatoes, chilies, cucumbers, and melons. Grandma Shirley even brought us some of her seedlings to nurture. My boys liked helping me water and harvesting, but my two older daughters did not show much interest. Last summer, we answered the door to a young neighborhood friend, grinning from ear to ear in his McDonald's cardboard crown, thinking of cake and soda pop while he waited for his eighth birthday party to start. I invited him into the backyard. He picked a ripe yellow pear tomato from the vine and popped it into his mouth. I watched the curiosity and confusion bloom. His eyes widened and he asked for more, please. He ate the rest of the tomatoes off the plant over the next hour. My married name is Gelhoff. It's German for a copacetic farmhouse. Our family has transformed a wasteland of weeds into a victory garden. My youngest, Jeremiah, wants to be a healthy vegetable farmer when he grows up. I could not be more proud. I want him to know the value of his full name and feel more connected to his roots than I do, than I ever did. It took courage to get my hands and heart dirty. But now I know how to pronounce my name. Marron. That was number one. We'll move on to number two. This is from Brandy Atikai. And forgive me because I will pause at the end of the video. Each video acknowledges the health department and the storytelling company that helped put these together. But I'll go ahead and, and just pause after the credits. All right, let's uh, go full screen here. We were all 
only a block away from my house when I seen a small, fragile woman digging through a dumpster. My daughter and I were driving around passing out food sacks. It's part of what we do for our community and humanitarian work at Rocky Mountain Sarah. I drove over to her and gave her the last two sacks I had left and handed her my coat. I told her, stay here and I'll be right back. Growing up, I was good in school and sports, but I always tested the boundaries. And then I would step over them. I kept a pretty tough exterior and often ignored others' advice. I didn't need help from anyone, I thought. At first, I broke the rules, and eventually it all caught up to me. I remember the day of my sentencing. When will I grow up? I have a 10 month old baby girl now. Get your act together. I built up enough courage to tell Honorable Judge Lobato I was truly sorry for my mistakes and I wanted to change. This was not the real me. I faced a jail sentence and additional time on house arrest. I told the judge I wanted to get that done right away so I could move on. He agreed to the plea. He also told me he wanted me back in his courtroom in one month to see my progress. One month later, I reported back, told him I was employed. He told me to report back again in another month. I went in and I told him I was promoted to a teacher's assistant and enrolled in early childhood classes in college. From then on, I understood goals have to be measurable. This person, this man, this human being cared. He held me accountable and showed me he believed in me when it was hard to believe in myself. When I got back to the dumpster, the woman was there waiting. I brought her all I could from my house, things she needed much more than what I did. Hot water for cocoa, clothing, food, she had the thermos of hot water to her cold face. It was a treat to have all that at one time, she said with a smile. We ended up talking for over an hour, mostly about men wanting her only for her body, losing her kids, not having a bathroom to use, the city bulldozing their campsites. There was obvious mental health issues from living on the streets but she just needed a friend at that moment. Someone who could see past her problems to her humanity. I knew what that was like. It was a huge period of suck. I couldn't do anything right. In my tech support job, I just couldn't satisfy any of the customers. My boss was constantly on my case. What's the matter with you? Why can't you get this right? I would wake up each morning full of stress and fear from the nightmares of the night before. Talking to my therapist, I sobbed. I just want to be normal again. I quit my job and my friend needed some help taking care of his house in Pueblo. It seemed like a great opportunity for a change of scenery, so I moved. I thought it was only going to be here for a year or two. Back in San Diego, I had a friend who had given me a community garden plot as a birthday gift. It was wonderful, hard work in the outdoors, which I needed for my mental health. It was a great refuge from the dark place I was heading. Now in Pueblo, I was living in an apartment and really wanted to grow a garden. 
I was surprised I couldn't find a community garden here. So I asked the leadership of my new church if I could start one, and they readily agreed on the spot. Yes, we should do that. It would be a good way to connect with our community. And so I created the Miracle Community Garden. We easily got five gardeners on board with the project. I got our members to help build and a few local businesses to donate items or give us discounts. It was really amazing how the whole community came together and got involved. My pastor suggested I become a master gardener so that I could take on a leadership role and people would realize I know what I'm talking about when I'm teaching them how to grow food. We are now in our ninth year. When I walk into the garden, in the spring especially, I see the flowers are blooming and everything is green. People driving by stop to look and talk to me about the garden. I take a deep breath of fresh air and remind myself that, wow, I did this. This is my creation. All right. First, a round of applause to all of our storytellers. Super dope. Very thankful that you were able to take time and you were willing to share that with us. Ooh. Okay, Maggie, how excited are we to go to the bar today? <laughs> Sorry, guys. That was, that was on Derek's channel. <laughs> you can follow up with that trip with Maggie. Um, so yeah, let's open it up for a little bit of conversation. Dr. Kelly and Derek and Brandy, if you wouldn't mind sharing a couple comments on why you chose to um, participate in the storytelling workshop and what you hope the story will do in terms of pushing your personal desires and the work of the Food Project forward. Uh, Dr. Kelly, let's start with you. Wow, those are great questions. I wish you sent me them sooner. No, just kidding. <laughs> I think it was um, a really great experience when I signed up. I wasn't sure what to expect, and I thought it might help me professionally to be ready to be on camera and to tell my story authentically and to make meaning of the work that we're doing together. And all of those things have come true. And I also had to really dig deep and understand what my story is. There was a couple of coaches from Denver and from Toronto who did just such a great job with us and helped me recognize why I didn't have very many traditions to begin with as an adult and how as an American, sometimes we have to really pick and choose what we want for, um, you know, this is the hardest age for youth with moral and cultural relativism. And so it's just a constant, stress if you're aware of your ethics to know what right and wrong is or to choose not to judge yourself and to forgive things that aren't your fault and so when i tried to do the race and F, um, equity challenge last year i was um, actually emotionally overwhelmed and unable to continue and this year i was able to dig in and understand why um, i had trouble owning my hispanic heritage and understanding why i had always chosen to identify as white and just trying to unpack the feelings around that. Thank you. Brandy? Yeah, it, it's a pretty awesome experience when you're able to show your vulnerability and um, some of your lowest points, you're able to grow from it and learn from it. And I think with every negative um, aspect that may happen in your life, there's a positive to come from it. And I encourage everybody to always think that if um, something happens to you, it's not purposely always just you, but take something from it. You always get to gain something again. And knowledge and love is powerful and love does not cost a thing. Um, to be able to grow through life and learn and, and share with others, that's the best recipe for you know um, more community and unity. And so being able to share your story, you're sharing a little bit about yourself, but you're hoping that you could reach out and touch somebody and hopefully um, they could share their story too. And, you know, it, it's really inspiring to be able to hear some of the others um, breaking through their shells to be able to tell their story as well. Um, so I encourage everybody, you know, share a little bit about yourself. It may not be good, it may not be bad, but um, 
just showing that vulnerability, um, it'll help you grow. Thank you. And Derek. Um, so my story, I just say, um, again, I just, and I signed up for it. I, I, didn't, I just, I mean, you just never know. And this is what came of it. And, you know, I, I, I just share how I overcome some mental health challenges. Um, and it's like um, Brandy said, one throws another one open. So that's what I want to share. Thank you. So the Colorado Health Foundation is interested in cataloging stories from the Pueblo Food Project specifically. Their process is going to be a little bit different than the process that the Pueblo Department of Public Health and Environment undertook, um, but they are welcoming um, story, written story, video, um, poetry, art, all different kinds, and they have um, folks to kind of help guide through. I'll quickly screen share a flyer, and this information is linked in the agenda as well, um, stories that matter. So if we had about 10 folks from the Food Project who were really eager um, to share their stories, uh, you know, with all of the things that we're dealing with on a daily basis, it would be so much appreciated for those who already did. Um, you can consider submitting your video and they might um, take that up as, as one of them and work with you. The really great thing, um, different than most of the time when people are asking for this kind of stuff, you can get paid. So they are willing to pay you for your story, <laughs> which snaps to the Colorado Health Foundation for doing it right, because sometimes it's challenging to do these things and to do it for free makes it even worse. So if uh, you are interested in being one of these folks, don't hesitate to reach out. We'll take a little poll at the end just to kind of gauge interest and we'll go from there. But there's greenery involved if that helps motivate you. Also, the Colorado Blueprint to End Hunger is interested in doing a listening tour, um, so more of an in-person meeting to just hear people share their stories real time, and that's something that we're thinking about planning for July. So just to put that on your radar, more information on that. And we are only three minutes behind schedule, so we're killing it. We're going to catch up right here. Um, during these updates. So let's go through our working group updates um, right now. And Mo, I ask that you kick us off with economy. Sure. So it's been a really busy couple of months in the food economy working group. And shout out to Monique for really stepping up and helping me out. Um, I've had a lot of stuff going on at the college. So um, our request for proposal is live for some a, a contractor to come in and design a 15-week curriculum, connect resources, create a repository for information for our food entrepreneurs, for the food entrepreneurship incubator, um, which we're calling the startup semester. So we are um, we had a nice Q&A session last week um, where people who are thinking about bidding came in and got to ask their questions and kind of get everything hashed out. Um, and so we are, I think June 1st, so Tuesday is when the proposals are due and then we'll be reviewing those in the next month um, and selecting our, our person to do that. We're also going to be, um, we're working on a planning grant from the USDA to create a food hub here in Pueblo. And so this will give us some funding to do some research, some that baseline data to select what the interest is, what the feasibility, of a food hub is, so that's really exciting. It aligns exactly with our two strategic pillars for our working group. Um, and then we had a really good discussion about the American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA funds, which come to Pueblo and what we can do with that. Um, we're talking about possibly bringing a commissary kitchen to Pueblo and maybe in, as part of that food entre entrepreneurship incubator. Um, we're also looking at how to get the workforce back to work in restaurants. Um, and then other ideas, um, stuff for community gardens and a genuine Pueblo marketing campaign to help us bounce back and really promote our products that are produced here in Pueblo beyond our region. So um, lots of good discussions going on and I think we already probably have a full agenda for June. All right, Dr. Kelly, Food and Farm Literacy and Education. All right, 
We had seven attendees this time. We're having a consistent participation of about five to 10 members. So I'd like to ask you to recruit people if you find anyone interested in continuing to share this um, strategy on education. But we did have a wonderful um, icebreaker about how spicy do you like your peppers? And we're continuing to um, promote the activities and uh, community resources going on throughout the summer, things like the All Pueblo Grows Seed Bank and CSU Extension classes, the Sunnyside Market, and also just encouraging people to volunteer where they can, um, the edible landscapes, cooking matters classes, the IFIS aquaponics demo going at Campbell's Greenhouse there on 28th and Elizabeth, the La Familia Garden and Pueblo House Gardens are operating on the east side and Martin Luther King Jr. Um, Garden as well, and Vitamin Cottage E classes. So the library also has a DIY video series. There's so many things going on and we're just wanting to plug more people into them. And also we had a long uh, brainstorm about the ARPA money, including themes like agritourism and boosting what we already have and building towards that being a great systemic outreach. Uh, year-round growing demonstrations and a co-op uh, business style education towards a build out. Those were all the um, best ideas that are memorable, but we'll have to probably break out another task force to make that conversation towards a proposal. We also heard about Roncalli students addressing the D60 school board and um, the Fuji Kids Youth Council is doing great work with um, some online cooking classes too. Last but not least, we're evaluating all of our meetings now. And so just a hint that it's really important we keep going towards continual improvement data. And that if you have a chance to just put your 30 to 90 second input in on any of our meetings, it's so helpful to us progressing as a group and keeping it sustainable. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Jim. You're on mute. Probably the most exciting thing is that we're turning our eyes more directly uh, at at things that are uh, have a uh, little that have impact in land use uh, at the county and in the city level, uh, and that's a a great area given that the county's reviewing their uh, county land use. Uh, comprehensive plan, and I think it's it's uh, it's an important thing for the environment group to do. Uh, we meet at four o'clock because we try to help producers participate. And if that sounds interesting to anybody, I invite you to come along because I think it will be very interesting. We'll have more interaction with the local jurisdictions, and that's probably the most important thing I can share with you today. All right. And how about Lindy? Morning. So our food access working group, um, shout out to everyone who's attended the meeting and our subcommittees. So we, uh, you've heard before, we've been working on developing scripts and finding local Puebloans to be in our food assistance videos. So everyone can learn more about um, programs such as SNAP, WIC, Double Up Food Bucks, Pantries, how to use it, how does it benefit our community. Um, so we're at the point where those scripts are just about ready, are, are ready to go. We have an RFP out for a videographer. So we'll be filming those in June or July. Um, so our May meeting was uh, following up on many of these projects and getting to vote on spending some money or um, putting in those requests for a uh, final approval. So we have one for the videographer, um, as well as some compensation for the actors in our videos. Um, we have the same cafe feasibility study after we had the leadership from the same cafe team come and take a tour of different parts of our food system in Pueblo. Um, and then the farmer's market, which is food access, as well as food, food and farm literacy and education. We've planned some really fun, um, inclusive activities for the market and um, a spending request to help 
uh, support some of those to make them fun for everyone in our community while they come out and shop for local fruits and veggies. Um, and then we also brainstorm some more ideas for ARPA. That's it. All right, and I will go for advocacy. Um, so the advocacy working group put together a concept of having sector updates across different um, key stakeholder groups in Pueblo to help bring ideas to the Pueblo Food Project and potentially influence our, our work and really serve as a data gathering op opportunity. Last night, we held our first sector update with all of the community garden leaders around town. Um, so we had garden representation from all sides of the city. Um, so very grateful that folks were able to participate as well as CSU Extension. And we came up with some really great ideas on how to make community gardening more um, feasible and how to use some of this ARPA money to make it more sustainable in the long term. So that was a very effective first run of our goal for the sector updates. So I know that the advocacy um, group put a lot of thinking into how those could roll out and we did it last night. So rock on there. We also had a good brainstorm on um, the ARPA funds thinking through, as mentioned, a community garden support program, as well as touching back on the um, Pueblo, genuine Pueblo food, Pueblo food marketing concept and how we can really build into that tourism and pillar, tourism and hospitality pillar um, there. So yeah, uh, great job to the advocacy working group and thanks for everyone who participated. We also evaluated a couple of policies which are really going to guide our June meeting. So shout out in advance to the advocacy working group for helping plan that agenda. All right, Megan, do you want to give us a 411 on um, the Sun Soil Water Conference? Yeah, I can do that. Um, so yesterday we went and toured um, PCC to check out what that would look like for the conference. It looks like it's going to work perfectly. So we're really excited about that. Um, we're definitely moving forward right now with specific scheduling and just figuring out all those perfect little details um, to make it happen, starting to get um, marketing together to um, get the word out. Um, what else? I had something else in my head and it disappeared. Um, you know how that goes. Monique, am I missing anything? Not too, not too exciting quite yet. I think that's a that's a good cover. Start thinking, start letting your juices meld, start thinking about your collaborators who are going to be your partners to submit really cool content for sessions at the conference. Um, we have really great spaces, as Megan mentioned, one of the breakouts will be totally ready for hands on type learning. Um, so not just classroom style, but we can actually do stuff. Um, so be creative in your concepts and let's see what bubbles to the surface. Yeah. Okay, I will provide a very brief update for the Pueblo Fuji kits because it's graduation week and half of the Fuji kits are rising, well, graduating seniors and the other half are rising seniors and all of them are participating in commencement in some way because they're all stars. Who watched City Council on Monday? Say I. Okay, well, you missed out because the Pueblo Fuji Kids provided a staff report for the award that they received from the Colorado Blueprint to End Hunger. This is the first time in my history that a youth member has ever been offered the opportunity to provide a staff report to City Council and they crushed it. So if you're not familiar with the process, there's a first reading, okay, second reading, and that's where you have to deliver the staff report. Then there's community deliberation, and then city council gets to vote. And two of our youth council members delivered that report on camera in front of city council. And it was a unanimous vote for them to do what they want to do. So shout out to them. Uh, we also spent some time last week tagging up our spot on the wall. We will get out there and start painting um, in June, but if you're cruising down the river trail and you happen to see all of this 
crazy tape and flowers and whoa, what's going on over there? That is the home of the Pueblo Fuja Kids mural on the levee. We're going 36 by 24. It's gonna be major. <laughs> That's, it's a big mural. So very excited for them. Last thing on the Fuja Kits, they sent out a flyer for cooking lessons amongst their peers. You've heard me talk about this before. Within the first two days of that sign up being live, they are already at 245 signups for peer to peer, kid to kid cooking classes. So, yeah, thank you for the claps, Brandy. That's a big one. All right. Um, my coordinator's report today is going to be extremely brief. There are a couple of things that I want to do. Um, first, Dylan, can I put you on the spot? Are you on the line? Hey, man, come off mute. Everyone, yeah. Pueblo Food Project Coalition, please meet Dylan. Dylan is the um, new person in town for the Palmer Land Conservancy. He's building his office here. I'll let him tell you a, a couple of words about himself, and then we'll all give him a round of applause and say, welcome. But Dylan, go for it. Yeah, thanks Thanks for the spotlight, Monique. Um, yeah, hi, everybody. I'm a, Well, first, I'm really excited to be able to hop onto these calls and onto these committees to first listen and learn. That's, you know, my priority coming into a new community. Um, and I'm really excited to be able to help in whatever ways I can and leverage the resources that Palmer Land Conservancy can bring to Pueblo County. Uh, most of the work that I'm doing is in the uh, in the Bessemer ditch with the irrigated lands. And, uh, and the idea is to really build a resilient food economy uh, on that end by securing water rights. That's essentially the work that we're doing, but there's there's a lot more. Really, we're, you know, we're here to help and that's gonna be, that's gonna be my role moving forward. Thank you. And Dylan, if you wouldn't mind throwing your email in the chat so folks can reach out to you, that'd be great. Certainly. And yes, round of applause. Welcome to the crew. This Dylan, Dylan has decided to move to Pueblo sight unseen, y'all. He's coming down, he's jumping right in. So we gotta show him around, let him know what's good and help him out when he asks. So please show him kindness and generosity when he's um, reaching out to you. Yeah, hey, Dylan, thanks so much. Thanks so much. How about your last name and where you're moving from? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so my last name, Dylan O'Hare. O'Hare is my last name. Uh, I'm moving from Fort Collins, where I uh, got my MBA at Colorado State University, <clears throat> and uh, and I moved I moved out to Colorado from Birmingham, Alabama, where I grew up, um, a fellow uh, steel industry city. So it it feels uh, oddly reminiscent, um, you know, having visited Pueblo. So I'm really excited to uh, you know enjoy a bit of the familiarity. Okay, the next thing that I want to say, shout out to every person on this call who showed up to the convention center on Monday and helped put together these backpacks for the homeless. Megan did a great job blasting us on social media. I know others on the call did too. We had 19 pallets of food. This was the largest distribution that we ever attempted to put together in one day with people power, the power of the people of Pueblo. And we put together 808 bags for the homeless. And these are not chintzy bags, y'all. These are heavy bags that are going to provide sustenance for a good deal of time. So we're feeling very excited about that. With the extras, um, with the extras that we had, we donated to the Boys and Girls Club to Christ Life Ministries, which is a rehab slash recidivism program here in town, and also to the Belly Box run by the Arts Alliance. So no can of tuna was left behind. <laughs> and we're very grateful for everyone who came out and got their hands dirty, could not have done it without you. The last thing that I wanna say in my coordinator's report, and I bet half of you already know what I'm going to say. It's four little letters a r p a it's one word arpa we have to get those proposals submitted to arpa we must right now there are about 30 proposals submitted a couple of folks are going in for eight million dollars 
there's only $18 million to spend this year. So if you want your idea considered for a year one round of funding for the American Rescue Plan Act dollars, $18 million is sitting in the bank at the city of Pueblo. It's here. I didn't make it up. I wasn't blowing smoke. A couple of rumors going on out there. This money cannot be used on roads. I heard from a community member, all of this money is going to be used on roads. Not true. It can't be used on roads. They already know how they're going to spend all of this money. Not true. We haven't even begun to think through that. There are task forces if you want to be involved. If you want to be part of that decision making process. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Pueblo ARPA. If you need help writing your application, holler at a player. I've done it once, I'll do it again, and I'm gonna keep doing it until every single one of our ideas is submitted for consideration for this $18 million. So please take me seriously. The money's here, it's my money, it's your money, it's our money. It's money for the community of Pueblo to bounce back from the health and economic impacts of COVID-19. So I'm certain we can come up with some great ideas. All right, with that, I am going to whoop, zip the lip and ask, does anyone on the line have an appreciation or a community announcement that they would like to share? Ooh, ooh, I do. This is Derek. Go for it, um, Derek. The Alpoba Grows is going to have our educational uh, event on Saturday morning at 9.30. We're going to be talking about diseases and um, insects in the garden um, that you may encounter in, the, in June. That's for Alpoba Grows. Awesome. Thank you. Brandy? Brandy, then Tom? Yep. Um, so I did want to inform everybody that we are going to be having a community-wide dog patch cleanup day on June 19th. And we are currently looking for more vendors to join in with that. Um, so we're going to be having large rollaway dumpsters and we're going to inform the community to have all their unwanted trash pre-packed at the bottom of their driveway on that Friday morning. Um, Saturday, we're going to have a ton of volunteers going around picking up the trash. At the St. Anne's Park, we're gonna have um, food. So we're gonna have pizza and drinks. Also, we're working on getting maybe a mobile market or having some other food items to give away. Um, I'm gonna be bringing a lot of books for children, teens and adults. Um, and I don't have a limit. We're gonna give out everything that we can give out. But we just wanna be able to provide that dog patch um, Eastwood Heights community with more resources. Um, so if anybody has an organization that would like to give out some information and spread the word, um, we would love that and greatly appreciate it. We would just need to know before um, this Friday so we could put your information on the flyer as well. Um, and this initiative is being kicked off by the Colorado Trust. Oh, thank you for sharing that. That's really exciting. Uh, okay, Tom. Tom, then Jen, then Jim. Okay, just really quick, I want to give a shout out to Dr. Kelly. When we were working on the community garden here um, at Martin Luther King Jr., she brought her kids out. I'll tell you, we had such a blast. The kids were having a good time. If you're involved with a community garden somewhere and you've got kids, take them with you. Let them play in the dirt. This is good, healthy, well, except for the steer manure, it's good, healthy dirt. Um, Make sure they wash their hands before they eat, but let them ask questions, ask them questions as well. Get them more, more involved to bring some of these kids. Jen, you'll agree with me on this, I know. So a uh, big shout out for her bringing those kids up. We, I had a blast having them hanging out with us. Thank you, Tom. Okay, Jen. Um, thank you as always to this group. This group just makes my heart so happy in so many ways. Just everything that's being done. Um, and I want to give a huge shout, Mon Monique. Whatever you're getting paid, they need to like quadrillion multiply it because just what you facilitate getting done. But also, just someone mistakenly credited me for work with the um, the Fuji kits last night, and I was like, no, no, no. Like you have to know, like this is this is who is the brilliant people who are behind actually like getting these youth 
going and I can't wait till grocery change. Sorry, this just sounds bad. I can't wait for grocery change project to be over for the distributions so I can get in to it because I got my brain back. Woo! Um, so if I can just get through the distributions next week, I got tons of transplanting because hail and rain kind of wrecked our roads twice and pushed back the distributions. They're happening next week. We can get our, um, our trailer out safely. It's gonna finally happen. We've been loving on them, but um, just you all are the most brilliant, heart-filled, just community game changers. And I'm so just every day grateful for everything that you're doing. So mwah, thank you. All right, Dr. Jim, we're at 10.01. So you all right. about that. <laughs> Super quick, Monday was great. Uh, packing those 800 plus uh, backpacks. Really a wonderful time, can't wait to do it again. And fuel and iron, the incoming uh, uh, food uh, hall will have uh, a Latino chamber sponsored coffee break uh, on 6 1. There'll be quite a bit of, uh, there'll be tours and explanation. And if you have time, you might want to come by. Uh, and the people that are building that, uh, one of them has already bought a house in Pueblo, even though they're from Denver. So, it's catching on. All right. And yes, Amanda threw something in the chat. Um, we did a farmer's market yesterday at um, CCA and it was super fun. All the kids got to take goodies home. So thanks, Amanda, for the invitation. We are at 10.02. Megan just dropped a feedback link in the chat. Please just click that link right now. It's going to take you 30 seconds. Click it, click it. Put in your feedback. Really appreciate it. And with that, we call it a wrap and we will see you all in June. Thank you so much. Um, council representatives, please hang tight. We'll start up at 1010. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. Monique, the link in the chat is telling me it's unable to open. Just a heads up. Ah, oh, got it. Never mind. Use the okay. second one, Jen. Yeah, the gotcha. lower one. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Jen. Hi, hon. Hey, hi, honey. Listen, um, I need to know, do you have any connections in uh, Colorado City or Rye to maybe bring down um, the Karen Chair Food Grocery Store style truck? Oh my gosh, yes. Let, send me some information so we don't get it all here, but uh, give me some contacts. Um, to see if we can do that. We'd like to do both places, maybe on a one day trip and spend an hour or so at each location. Um, to, so uh, later on so, today or sometime this week, maybe con uh, connect me with me again, okay? So in Colorado City, like where I only, um, not in Walsenburg, I have one for Colorado City. I, I, if we need to go to Walsenburg, let's, let's talk about that as well then. We're putting together something with Karen Chair and East to try to spread out even farther than we are right now with this mobile grocery store truck. That's incredible. And what like, we're, and what seriously. We're gonna try, what we're going to try to do as well is if we can get some of the uh, dairy and meat products as well and put them in the East um, refrigerator truck, we'll do both of, take both of them down and do that that way and spend That's a half hour, hour two hours, okay? 
that's that's amazing like that that's a game changer there's two communities that have been really really hard hit that we have connections with that we've been donating our extra eggs to and that we're working to get starts to them so they can start community gardens um in their spaces and try to help on the like fresh produce end of things but man tom that would be huge thank you so much well, yeah, yeah let me know who i need to talk to what we can do we'd like to start doing this as soon as possible um we just need some days and times and locations and maybe even volunteers to help us Once oh yeah they have they've patched together their own sort of like small scale food distributions at each of these communities or that, but they have, they run into trouble all the time with trying to be able to get people to get the food actually brought down and all that stuff. Like their, their, their work, they have been laying the groundwork to do it and just don't have the resources to do it on the larger scale. And you could totally be like the leverage it takes it just like not even to the next level, but to the next 10 levels. So I actually like the organizers of each of these distributions I'm very familiar with and they're wonderful people and they do have their own core volunteers already in place that try to make it happen. Okay, I know that I've been talking to Shelly and Fred over here at the VFW here on 4th Street and I know that when there's a group of people from Rai that comes up and picks up from there yes pantry and takes it back down sometimes yes. it's a hit or miss so how can we make that so they don't have to make the trip is the thing is what we're trying to do yes and that's the that's probably the colorado cares group or not colorado cares um colorado city cares um group but it's the applewood the community of applewood estates okay. um yeah well, oh my gosh okay. yep Whatever you you're amazing you can help me with go ahead and Send me information or we can talk later on, just you and I together and see I can maybe get you on a conversation with um, Stephen Williams from Karen Chair, who's doing this direct distributing um, thing for Karen Chair, and maybe then with Marcy as well. We'd love to we'd love to find out from or if you have someone we should talk to down there, get them included as well. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, honey. I knew I could. I knew I, if I talked to you, you'd have a lot better ideas than I did. So uh, it's not a lot better ideas, just like being in the area. That's all. OK, well, I appreciate you, honey. I, I appreciate you. you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I miss you too so much. I miss I'm, I miss people like <laughs> miss everyone. I miss you. Like Jess and I were actually talking about you the other day, just like, oh, my gosh, it would be so good to see you again. Um, well, I, just, need to, I need to try to make some kind of a trip. My brother-in-law is coming down in his